Welcome to Bird Ultrasound Case of the Week. This week we have a fascinating case of Achilles tendon CPPD. So CPPD is calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate deposition. It's a crystal deposition disease that we can see in many parts of the body. It has a propensity to like to migrate into fibrocartilaginous structures. So we may see it commonly in the triangular fibrocartilage of the wrist. Uh, the meniscus of the knee would be another very common location. When it migrates into hyaline cartilage, it sits in the middle of the cartilage. So we know that gout crystals tend to aggregate, that's monosodium urate, tend to aggregate on the surface of the hyaline cartilage. CPPD tends to aggregate in the centre of the cartilage. It's not a perfect rule, but it's pretty close to perfect if you want to live by it. When we x-ray CPPD, it has enough mass enough density to show on the x-ray so we will see it on our plane radiographs which is another clue it doesn't need an enthesis it doesn't need to be immediately adjacent to an enthesis to migrate into the tissue that it lives within so occasionally we'll see it in odd locations a fair way from the enthesis in a tendon or in a fibrocartilaginous structure I don't see CPPD very commonly in the Achilles tendon, and that's what makes this case of the week quite unusual. When I put the transducer on this patient, I thought, wow, that is truly spectacular. And the other thing, when I went to look at the other side, is it looked similar, uh, not quite as an aggressive process, but it had a similar sort of process. And I thought to myself, I wonder what this represents. So I had a range of differential diagnoses. The first thing that came to mind was, is it hydroxyapatite deposition? So is this calcific tendinosis? And this immediately I think I can discount because hydroxyapatite requires an anthesis. It has to come from the anthesis at the calcaneum and really aggregates immediately adjacent to the anthesis. So this would be a really unusual distribution pattern for hydroxyapatite. The second thing I thought is, is this gout? Um, being bilateral, it was uh, reasonably tender on palpation. You can see the fat around the Achilles tendons a little bit echogenic as well. So I thought, is this gout? And the patient had no history of gout. Uh, and I thought, well, it still could be gout, although gout crystals in the Achilles tend to be a bit finer. So they don't tend to aggregate in little clumps like this. They tend to be finer, more like someone has sort of scattered salt, if you like, within the tendon. So it didn't really fit the typical gout pattern. I thought I'll find out a bit more information when we do the plane radiographs, because if it's gout, you really won't see much at all on the plane radiographs. But if it is CPPD, it should show up quite nicely on the plane radiographs. The third thing that I thought it might be was Achilles tendon xanthoma. So this is a cholesterol deposition disorder where lipid-laden macrophages aggregate within the Achilles tendon. And it can look a little like this. So this was a differential most certainly. Uh, the distribution uh, could be possible, uh, the location is possible, and the tendon was certainly swollen and tender as you'd expect with a tendon that has Achilles tendon xanthoma involvement. Xanthomas, because they're cholesterol-laden uh, infiltrate, don't show up on the plain x-ray. So I thought, again, we'll learn a bit more when we get to the plain radiograph. Another thing that came to mind was, could this be dystrophic calcification? So are we dealing here with a tendon that's had diffuse and uh, progressive disrepair phase tendinosis that's then tipped over the edge to being degenerative phase tendinosis and are we looking at multiple areas of tenocyte exhaustion where rather than developing little lake, liquid lakes of mixor degeneration we've developed areas of calcification and I thought again we'll see what the plain x-ray looks like because if these are areas of calcification we would expect them to show nicely on the x-ray. I thought it was unlikely though, because whenever I see dystrophic calcification in the Achilles tendon, or any other tendon for that matter, it's really dense calcification. And if you look at these, the deposits that are inside this Achilles tendon, you can see straight through them. So they, they cause very minimal attenuation of the sound beam. If you take this one here, for example, and look at the collagen behind it, you can see it perfectly. If this was, for example, an area of, of uh, dystrophic calcification, I would expect there to be an acoustic shadow behind it. But even where we've got three on top of each other here, we can still see some detail in the collagen here. So it's a little more attenuative than the background collagen, but not a whole lot more. So I was puzzled, and I took some more videos and images, and you can see that there is innumerable deposits of 
this crystal deposition inside the Achilles tendon. It's a very widespread process. If you look at the background uh, texture of the Achilles tendon, it is abnormal. So there's no doubt that there's an element of disrepair tendinosis here uh, that is then overlaid with some type of crystal deposition disorder as well. In fact, this is a really nice example of what I term particle board transformation. If you think about a healthy Achilles tendon, it has linear lines like laminated wood, and then when it gets into a disrepair phase tendinosis uh, difficulty, that linear line architecture gets replaced with this spotty particle board type pattern, and that's what we're seeing diffusely through this tendon. In the transverse, I think you can see that the peritoneum is very thick. Uh, so there is some peritinonitis and the fat planes around the Achilles tendon look quite inflamed as well. So, so whatever the process is, uh, it seems to involve a degree of tendinosis, a degree of crystal deposition disorder, and then some peritinon, if you like, synovia enthesial complex, which is the Kager's fat pad, the peritinon in this case, uh, show some inflammatory response as well. You can see it extends all the way from the musculotendinous junction all the way down to the calcaneum. So it's a very diffuse and sort of widespread event that's happened and you can see most of the Achilles tendon is involved. When we put the advanced dynamic flow on, you can see that the tendon is diffusely hypervascular as well, and, and that would be just consistent with the disrepair phase of tendinosis that we're seeing in the background here, I think. So lots of vessels, and there's a beautiful vessel there. You can see that one, the blue one here, streaking its way through here, and that's in the peritinon. So there is a significant peritinonitis component as well. So this is, again, just proving that the, the fat pad around the Achilles tendon and the peritinon are involved in an inflammatory response. In the long axis, you can see vessels coursing in between all around through the collagen. And you can also see this one here. If you look just every now and then here and here, this is not real flow. This is twinkle artifact. Now, this is another clue because when you see twinkle artifact, the twinkle artifact must be caused by something that's crystalline in nature. Now, CPPD, calcium pyrophosphate dihydrate deposition, certainly ticks that box. And so this is another clue that we're dealing with CPPD. This is the icing on the cake, though. And the icing on the cake is that they are quite radiodense, so there is multiple of them. If these were xanthomas, they would be invisible on this plane radiograph. If it was gout, so monosodium urate, you would not see it on the plane radiograph. If it was hydroxyapatite, it should be here, coming off of the, the calcaneum, just at the anthesis here, and you wouldn't expect to see it stranded up here in the middle of the Achilles tendon. If it was an anthesophyte, you'd expect to see that growing, again, from the anthesis here, and it would be more bony density in nature. And if it was dystrophic calcification, you would expect them to be much denser than, than these uh, crystallizations that we're seeing here. So I think when we put the plane radiograph and the ultrasound together, Achilles CPPD is the correct answer. And you can see the, the process that I've been through to consider the other differential diagnosis and then arrive at this conclusion. Another nice thing, if you've got eagle eyes, you've probably already noticed it, but uh, when you look at the plantar fascia here, you can see, sure, there's an enthesophyte here, but this is the plantar fascia, and you can see the plantar fascia actually has a very similar involvement. So the CPPD has not only uh, invaded and spread throughout the Achilles tendon, but it's also involving the plantar fascia, so it's a, a two-location process here. Just to show a couple of the other alternatives that I flagged along the way there. This is an anthesophyte, so you can see it's really bone density. It comes from the anthesis. It's, it's simply a bone spur growing into the tendon, so it is representative of a breakdown between the, uh, the barrier between the tenocytes and the osteocytes, so that is the anthesis. You see these very commonly in people with seronegative arthropathies, uh, such as psoriatic arthritis. But uh, this is a very different process. This is very dense. It's got a dense acoustic shadow. It looks nothing like the patient that we've been seeing. And this is gout, and you can see the way that gout crystals have this much more salt and pepper type arrangement through the Achilles tendon. It's a lot more subtle, and it's like a diffuse, uh, almost fairy floss type or cotton wool type infiltration throughout the tendon. If you look at it in the transverse here, you can see that there's quite subtle but distinct areas of crystal deposition within the Achilles tendon. That's monosodium urate. It'll be tender and sore to touch. And when you do a plain radiograph, you really don't see any evidence because the monosodium urate doesn't have an, a high enough atomic number to cause attenuation of the x-rays. And so we don't tend to see them on the plain radiograph.
Hydroxyapatite was another potential possibility, and this is hydroxyapatite. However, what differs between this and the CPPD that we're discussing is that this comes directly from the anthesis, so it has to come from the anthesis. There's no way you're going to find hydroxyapatite stranded in the middle of the Achilles tendon. When we do a, a plain radiograph of this uh, hydroxyapatite deposition, you will see it on the uh, on the X-ray, so it'll show a similar density to the CPPD. However, the location will be different, so I think we can rule this out as a possibility as well. So it's a fascinating process to go through, isn't it? You start off with, what have we had there? Four or five different differential diagnoses, and then we've whittled it down, and we've decided that CPPD was the answer, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. But it's a great process to go through, looking at the plain radiographic appearance of each of the disorders, uh, considering their distribution and where we're finding them anatomically within the Achilles tendon structure, and then we can arrive at the correct conclusion of CPPD. I hope you've enjoyed this brief discussion. Happy scanning and bye for now.